Um, my name is Stephen Weiber. I am the Director of for Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. We are a federation made up of associations of institutions. We have the dual roles both of providing a space where professionals from around the world can get together, can look collectively for answers to the challenges that we're all facing, and to act as an advocacy organisation, making sure that external stakeholders understand what libraries can do, but also what libraries need in order to be able to fulfil their missions. So, first of all, in terms of what are the main benefits of open GLAM, including open access, sharing, reuse of cultural heritage. I think clearly plenty of people have, have contributed to this session, to, 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 to this series already, and you've heard sort of key arguments about the importance of democratic access, of making sure that we don't, making sure that everyone has that possibility to be involved. I think deep down, actually, one of the things that Open Glam can help us combat is this idea that culture is somehow something that's elitist, something that's narrow, that's limited only to a select group of people who have the time, who have the instinct, who have the practice, the, the culture even, of going to participate in culture. I think it's always the problem when culture, cultural institutions are looking to make the case for support, looking to make the case for laws, in, laws are within government in order to be able to fulfill their missions, that they're not always seen as being about something for everyone. They're not seen as being a, a wider, broad-based policy issue. And so Open Glam provides that means of breaking down that idea, breaking down that idea that culture is just something for the few, not for the many. A further benefit of this, I think, is that also it's making clear that Open Glam, that culture is not something that we want to keep for ourselves. Open Glam provides a means of recruiting other people, other actors, other players with a wider range of skills. For example, it's something that we certainly look to do within the library field is promote the idea that libraries, drawing on their collections, drawing on their recognisability, drawing on their name recognition, can combine with others who have different skills, different talents, different possibilities in order to do something new, in order to produce new services, to create bro a broader range of types of impact, to have that broader positive impact on society as a whole. Again, this is something that is facilitated when libraries are able to open up their collections, are able to actually work with others. So I think there are those two key aspects in addition to all the answers, all of the arguments that you will have already heard that I said, it's a way of combating this image of culture as an elite thing. And it's a way of recruiting, of really making sure that we are drawing on all available talents, all available energies in order to realize the potential of culture as a driver of development. In terms of what the barriers are, again, there's been some really excellent work that's carried out so far, in particular by people like Andrea Wallace, talking really with institutions, talking with them about what they've tried, what they've not managed to do, the hesitations, the barriers, the blockages that they faced. Um, I think one of the things that comes out of that, and one of the things that I know that we, we think about in general is the risk of it just being a, sometimes a question of a lack of imagination. It's a new way of doing things. We've got very used to, and indeed, you know, people know the images of old, the, the more traditional libraries, the original libraries where the books are chained to the bookshelves in order to stop too many people accessing them in order to prevent theft. We have seen this shift, this overall to flip towards rather than chaining things down, letting them fly free. This is nonetheless something that it continues to require an effort that the collection is something to be used that it needs to be used now rather than simply preserved in order to be used in the future. It's, this is pretty key if we're to show the value of the investment that we're making. I think there's also an issue which again comes out in, 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 in what Andreas says, comes out in what others say. There's a risk that we follow the logic that, well, maybe if we keep something locked up, maybe if we keep it hidden away, we can make money from it in the future. It's the logic of, Jack and the giant beanstalk and the magic beans that maybe if we keep it for ourselves, there is that magical profit, that pot of gold or whatever in the future that will come to us. And the problem is that 
firstly, this is deeply uncertain, but also it does actually have a real cost right now. At the same time, I know clearly a lot of institutions are facing a pressure to be able to show that they are able to make their own money in order to justify continued public investment. That can certainly lead to a logic of saying, well, we are trying to retain things. We're trying not to lose potential to earn money in the future. Um, this is something I've known. The sense is, and, and the data certainly points in the direction of this not being a good strategy for the most part. This isn't actually something that will help because, first of all, as we know, making things open, providing access actually is a great way of bringing people in to the institutions as a whole, of raising awareness, of raising interest, and also the likelihood of being able to make money on a purely com on a more commercial market is relatively limited. So we need to banish this from our heads, this idea that, yes, if only we keep things back, if only we keep things locked away, somehow in the future they're going to make a lot of money. It's not going to happen, and in fact it poses costs in the short term which turn into costs in the longer term. I think a final thing, which may be a, a slightly controversial thing to say, I'm conscious, that often there can be a sense that by keeping things locked away, this is a way of, of, of sticking it to Google. This can be a way of, of, of preventing major technology companies from using content, from benefiting from content in one way or the other. Now, of course, that's understandable. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of concern about the way that major technological companies work. And certainly, I know as IFLA, as the library sector as a whole, we certainly have deep concerns about the lack of transparency, about the way that some algorithms work, the impact that these have on people's experience of the internet, the impact that these have on the right of access to information. The problem is locking things away is not necessarily the most effective way of trying to get back at these companies. And indeed, when you put things behind paywalls, you tend rather to benefit those users with deeper pockets and disadvantage those who don't have the resources to actually use materials to make the most of materials. And so I think we also just need to get over the idea that making things open is just giving a present to major tech companies. It isn't. It's actually more likely to give it, provide a bonus, to provide a benefit for the smaller players, for the individuals, because in the end, if the tech companies want something, they have the resources to actually pay for it. In terms of things that have opened my eyes, in terms of, 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 of things that made me try and think differently about how we do open in general, I think something that we've certainly come across through IFLO, in particular in our engagement with the Human Rights Council around universal periodic reviews, around the work of the special procedures rapporteurs and, and, and the, the special rapporteurs within, within the, the, the Rights Council, within the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, is this concept of cultural rights. It's something that we don't necessarily think about. I don't know, when we look at the Universal Declaration, we focus a lot more on rights around democracy, around uh, freedom of expression and so on. But actually tucked away in there under Article 27A is this underlying that actually everyone has a right to take part in the cultural life of the community. And this is a, it's a really important thing. Of course, as it, it's near the end, it tends to get forgotten a little bit. But this actually underlines that this possibility, it's not a luxury. I think, as I said earlier, it's not just an elite thing that, that, that richer people can go to the opera or people who've, I don't know, the, the, the people who've gone to sort of private schools and so on can go to museums. It's actually something that everyone has this basic right to be involved in. And I think, I don't know, the way this idea is developed by special rapporteurs on, 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 on cultural rights is to focus on its meaningful access. It's not just the possibility to read, but it's the possibility to work with cultural references from your own cultures, from other cultures, in order to build cross-cultural understanding and promote multiculturality. Um, it's this idea that you need to have, that this is a fundamental part of people fulfilling their own potential of living together. And actually this human rights perspective is, it, it, it's a helpful one. I think it's a way of actually thinking about open glam in a way where it's not just it's not it's not just a particular political point of view. It's not just a particular movement that's going in one direction or the other. This is something that's based in the individual human rights of indi the, the human rights of individuals themselves. I know I've certainly found that that's it's it's a useful reference point. Again, it flips the discussion away from thinking about well, what do institutions do towards what do individuals have a right to. 
and how can we as cultural institutions as glam institutions do our bit to fulfill these rights Clearly, of course, this has a copyright angle. We shouldn't forget that Article 27 of the Universal Declaration, it starts with the rights to culture, the rights to research. It also clearly highlights that there's a right for rights holders themselves, for creators to, 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 to benefit from the fruits of their work. Clearly, there's then a need to make sure that we're engaging in advocacy that mean that we don't see these. We look for a way that complements the both of the complements both of these. But I think, I don't know, there's a strong case in there, and it's a certainly a case that we should be making that the job, the role of GLAM institutions in giving that broader awareness of raising that awareness of what's going on is actually a fantastic way of opening up new possibilities. But again, it argues that case we need to think about the policy side, the legal, the legislative side of things as well. In terms of what the personal message is to those hesitating to open up collections, I think a really crucial thing here is that, um, I think, as said, this is a human rights issue. There is such a thing as, as, as cultural rights. These are things that everyone is supposed to, is, everyone is supposed to enjoy. Everyone should, no one should be left behind in realising their cultural rights. And so by adopting open gland policies, by adopting those possibilities, institutions are actually fulfilling a human rights mission which is really obviously a really crucial thing to do i suppose also and perhaps this is more negative point but i think we know especially in a situation of, of information abundance on the internet and i'm conscious when i say that it's information abundance for certain language groups and for certain cultural groups but certainly i don't know if, for I don't know, if, I don't know, especially for people from cultures like mine, we do benefit from information abundance on the internet. The risk is that if we don't adopt open gland policies, then someone else will. There'll always be someone out there who's willing to produce content that grabs people's attention, that grabs their energy, their interest. And so if we don't follow the line, if we don't make sure that what we're doing is available, if we don't make sure that we are providing information to people, there's always someone who will do it and put adverts on the side of it. So there's also a real, it's also a real case of we can't just wait, we can't just assume that people will stick with us because of who we are. We need to make sure that we're also making what we're doing easy to access, that we're making it attractive, that we're making sure that the culture, the stuff, the, what we collect, what we curate, what we make sure, especially within the library sector, applying professional practices, applying professional values and skills, but we make sure that this then actually reaches its target goal, it reaches its audience, that it can fulfill its potential. Because I said, if we don't, someone else will try and do it and without necessarily following these same values, the same training, the same sense of what's actually going to make a positive difference. So I suppose, yes, yeah, so summarising very quickly that, yes, the personal message, what we're doing, Open Glam is a human rights mission. It is fulfilling a human right. And that more negatively, if we don't do it, someone else will.